And then uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Creasy here. Uh, for those of you who were here last Sunday night, you heard him, you met him. But uh, Neil is uh, on staff at Shadow Hills, uh, sister church here. He's also a professor of missions at Liberty University and works with, um, with Barry, our worship leader, not Clint, the other, the other guy. He'll be back next week. Um, but uh, they're working uh, currently on a project called uh, the Redemption Baptist Church. It's a network of um, house churches here in the valley. So God brought them uh, here uh, some years ago, brought us Barry then, even though we didn't know it. And uh, he's got Neil for us this morning. So Dr. Creasy, please. Well, good morning. Happy New Year. The first Sunday of 2014. It is hard to believe that 2013 has come and gone, but it officially has, and we begin a new year today. And it is a joy and a privilege to come and preach the Word of God this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible, the book of Philippians. It's a thank you letter. Paul's writing to the church of uh, Philippi and he's thanking them for their ministry to him while he's been incarcerated. And he's also praising them and thanking them for their participation in the gospel ministry. And so it's just a wonderful letter, a great letter of encouragement. And I pray that as we look at uh, chapter 3 this morning, that the Lord will bless you, the Lord will encourage you, and that he will challenge you through his word. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would prepare our hearts for your message. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us in a powerful way. Father, areas that we need uh, correction, Lord, would you bring correction. Father, areas that we need encouragement, would you bring encouragement. And Lord, I pray that we would leave here differently. Lord, that we would leave here more like Jesus because of what you do in our lives through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we begin this morning, we're going to begin in verse 10. And again, Paul is writing, and, and we're picking up in the middle of a section here. So I want to give you the context. Paul is writing in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul gives his personal testimony. He shares of how he had lived his life in a way trying to build a spiritual resume. He had lived and he was a passionate guy for religion. He was a passionate guy for his religious organization. He came from the right religion and, and he came from the right family and the right people. And, and in chapter 3, he's walked through all of the counterfeits of salvation that he'd been trusting in. And basically, all this spiritual resume that he had been building. And he declared that he had to count it as rubbish. He had to throw that away in order for something better. And we pick up with that thing which is better. In verse 10 he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As Paul writes to the church, he's writing about the focus that he has. As we begin a new year, what do we always do at the new year? We set New Year's resolutions. How many people have done that? All right. How many people have already broken their New Year's resolution? All right. We're what? Five days in. Okay. But we do that every year. And, and at the gym, at the gym, there will be floods of new people there for a few weeks. This is the best month for if you're an owner of a gym, because all these people sign up and they sign contracts and even for those that they don't make you sign a contract, they know the rest of the year you're going to pay your gym membership just so you feel a little bit better about yourself. Even though you may not go, you're going to send your money. Somehow that helps. Amen? And so 
It's a, it's a time of year where we reflect on last year and we look forward to the new year and we set New Year's resolutions. But the reality is, I think the greatest challenge we have in the Christian life today is that people are dominated by routine as opposed to living an intentional life. And that's what happens to our New Year's resolutions. We, we set these resolutions, I, I'm, I'm going to change this in my life, I'm going, to, I'm going to eat better, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then routine hits in. We make these promises during Christmas break when the regular routine is not going, but as soon as it kicks back in, what are we dominated by? That routine. I believe we would see a revolution in our country and around the world if Christians lived an intentional life and not just a life dominated by routine. And this morning, as we look here in Philippians chapter 3, I believe that Paul is a great example of what it means to live a life that's intentional about the glory of God. And he shares some things here that I pray will be a great blessing to us if we indeed implement them into our lives. And so the first thing I want you to see is that Paul had a great desire to know Christ. Everything that he had worked for in his spiritual life, everything that he had tried to achieve, he counted as rubbish for something better. He says that I may know him. Paul desired to have an intimate, personal, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. He wanted to know Christ, this word here in the Greek speaks of a knowledge that is experiential. He wanted to experience Jesus Christ. And friends, I want to tell you, you can set New Year's resolutions for what you're going to eat, for how much you're going to go to the gym, maybe for how often you're going to come to church, for how much you're going to give. But the greatest goal that you could have this next year is to know Christ more intimately and personally. As I chewed on this and I I wrestled with it, I I thought about, you know, this word is experiential. But oftentimes I think in in church life, we don't have this type of knowledge of God. We have more like a historical knowledge. I want you to think about something for a second. Just right where you are, you, you don't have to write anything down. But just, I want you to think for one minute of everything you know about Abraham Lincoln, all right? Think through it. What do you know? If you had to take a test right now on Abraham Lincoln, we, um, we all had to study him in history and when we were in school. And, and so everything you know about Abraham Lincoln, what all do you think you could say? I mean, he was famous for being the 16th president. He was the tallest president we've ever had. He served during one of the most difficult days of our history. And we have all these different things that we know about him. We probably, when I said Abraham Lincoln, uh, his, his picture came up in your mind and you think of the tall hat and the beard and the solemn face and this tall guy. But let me ask you, what, what did he love? What did his voice sound like? What made him happy? Because I think about how I know Abraham Lincoln, then I think about how I know my parents. I I think about my dad and how he grew up in a small town in Arkansas. He grew up working the fields and picking cotton and, and he was the first in his family to get a college degree. Then he went into the Navy, and, he, and, and I think about Dad, and I think about what he likes. My dad is kind of funny. He's one, and he got this from his mother. If we go to a restaurant, Dad just for some reason loves it if we all order the same thing. So he'll be like, what are you getting? And I'm like, I'm not telling you. <laughs> He's like, what? I said, because you're going to order what I'm ordering. That's weird. And, and so he usually waits and then orders what I, I mean, he just, he'll say, hey, why don't we go to this restaurant? We can all get this. I'm like, well, okay, well, why don't we go to the restaurant and we order what we want? And sometimes he's a little offended by that, but it's just one of his quirks. And, and Dad loves to tell stories, and he's a teacher at a community college. And, and I'm sure in his classroom, he teaches electronics and telecommunication, all sorts of technology, but I'm sure he's told many a story. And, and my, my dad is the king of inappropriate statements, that he'll say stuff, and you're like, I don't believe you just said that out loud, Dad. And and, and he, he loves to go to the movies, and he loves popcorn. I mean, he, 
He will sometimes go to the movie theater in town. We have a small little theater in Senatobia, Mississippi, and he'll just buy popcorn to go home and watch a movie. He's like, no, I'm not here to watch a movie. I just want some popcorn. And, and, and I know what my dad's going to say in a situation. I, I can almost finish his sentence. And, and when he calls and he speaks, I don't have to ask, who is this? Because I recognize his voice. And the older he gets, the more he sounds like my grandmother did. And I know the fears that my dad has, that he's had several family members who had Alzheimer's, and as he gets older, he worries, will that happen to him? I know he's looking towards retirement, but he's worried, will they renew his contract because he's not the youngest guy at the school, and these younger guys have come in. I know what brings him joy. I know what fears he has. I know his voice. He would be offended if he called and started talking to me. I said, who in the world is this? And I think, as I think about how I know my dad and how I know Abraham Lincoln, I wonder, how do I know God? Do the, ty the, the type of knowledge that I have of God, is it more like knowing Abraham Lincoln? Or is it more like how I know my dad? In the church, are, are we teaching people to have an intimate, passionate relationship with Jesus, an experiential relationship where, where they know Jesus? Are we teaching about a historical figure? And we're more worried about the acquisition of facts and figures than we are a passionate relationship. You see, Paul said, I want to know him. And friend, there's no greater aim that you could have for 2014 than to know Jesus. Now how, how do I know what my dad loves? How do I know what he hates? How do I know his voice? It's because I've spent so much time with him. And that's how we come to know Christ. Paul wanted to know Christ. But he goes on here and he expands this and he really gives us a full picture. He wanted to know Christ experientially, but he wanted to know all of Christ. He wanted to know fully the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes on, he, <coughs> excuse me, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him. In his death, he goes on, he says, I want to know him, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the very power that raised him from the dead, the very power that spoke and the world was created. I want to know the power and experience the power of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul had had all the religious experience he could stand. He knew what it was to stand in his own power and to go to the temple in his own power and to try to live a godly life in his own power. And he realized that he was powerless to do it. But then he experienced the true saving power of Jesus Christ. And his life was radically changed. He says, I want to know that power. And we read in the New Testament what God did in the amazing works. And it seems like we come to churches and we no longer see His power. You see, this is really progression. We want to know Him. But before we can see His power, we have to know Him. But then we have to want to know all of Him. He goes on and He says, to know the power of the resurrection, and may share his sufferings. This word share in the Greek is koinonia, it means fellowship. And here's the reality. What Paul's saying here is that I want to share with Jesus, and it's the type of sharing that brings community. Picture men who are in battle together, they're in the foxhole together, and they're sharing the suffering that goes on in war. They're sharing that experience. They're carrying that burden together. The community that forms between those men. This is what Paul's saying. He says, I want to share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now this word suffering is a unique word. It's 
used about 17 times in the New Testament and it's translated one of two ways. It has two meanings that it carries with it. First of all, it can be translated as passions. All right, it means that we share in the passions of Jesus Christ. But then the other way that it's used is that it means suffering. And I think both are appropriate here. Paul says, I, I want to share in the very passions of Jesus Christ. What he's passionate about, I'm passionate about. What he desires, what burdens his heart, burdens my heart. To such an extent that you're even to suffer and die for it. You see, this is where some people get off the ship. Some say, yes, I, I want to know Christ. I, I want to know Him. And, and yes, sign me up to know His power. I want to experience His power in my life. But I don't want to share His passion. I'm happy about being passionate about my job, being passionate about my entertainment, being passionate about my hobbies, being passionate about football, being passionate about whatever. And sometimes in the church we have passions over things that really aren't the things God's passionate about. Friends, I want to tell you, God is passionate about people. And a church that doesn't represent a passion for people is a church that doesn't have the passion of Jesus Christ. Jesus is passionate about the nations. He wants them to hear the gospel and, and praise the Lord for the goal that you set for Lottie Moon. But friends, I want to tell you, God wants you to do more than just give. He wants you to be passionate for his passions. And people say, no, I, I want my passions. And then he goes a step further. I want Jesus to know him. I want to experience his power. I may not be interested in his passions, and I'm definitely not interested. Theology of suffering is a foreign thing in the American church today. We think if something bad starts happening, it must not be God's will. If there's resistance, obviously God's closing the door. And friends, I want to tell you, we have an idol in the American church. It's called safety. Is it safe? Then it must not be of God. You see, I've worked in the Middle East. I've served on the Arabian Peninsula. When September 11th happened in 2001, I was 50 miles or so from Osama bin Laden's ancestral hometown. Not a great place to be on that day, by the way. I buried colleagues who were doing the exact same thing I was doing, and I was on my way to see them, and 45 minutes before I got there, a gunman came in and shot them because they were sharing the gospel. And I asked people, I said, well, would you pray about going? And they said, well, that, that doesn't seem safe. I remember I was sitting in seminary back when I was working on my master's, and Dr. Jerry Rankin, who was the president of the International Mission Board at the time, he was sharing, he was sharing about the shootings that had happened on the field, and he didn't realize I was there. Um, and I spoke to him afterwards, but when he was preaching, he said, our missionaries are being killed on the field. And he said, here's the greatest question that Southern Baptists have to ask. Are we willing for our missionaries to die for the gospel to go forth? That's the question we have to ask. And a year later, Dr. Rankin was back on campus and I was doing my PhD work and I I set up a time and I interviewed him for a journal that I, article that I was writing. And I said, Dr. Rankin, last year you asked this question. Are Southern Baptists willing for our missionaries to die for the gospel to go forth? You asked that a year ago. It's been a year. What's the answer? He said, we're struggling as a denomination on that. Because when it hits the news that one of our missionaries have died. The IMB is flooded with calls saying, you need to get them out of there. It's dangerous. See, Paul says, if I'm going to know Christ, I'm going to know the power of his resurrection. But also, I'm going to know suffering. And listen to me, friend. The center of God's will is oftentimes not the safest place to be. 
but it is always the best place to be. And Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to share in his suffering and be conformed to his death. I've prayed through this phrase, conformed to his death, be like him in his death. And it carries many things. It's a rich, rich text. First of all, it means that you empty yourself. It's not about you. It's about others. And Jesus was an example of that. He, God incarnate, the Bible says he emptied himself. And we're to do that. It's not about us. Friends, I want to tell you, if you're going to reach Las Vegas with the gospel, that means you're going to have to do things as a church that you may not be comfortable with. But it's not about you. It's about others. Christ's death brought life to others. When we die to our wants and our desires and our flesh and we live for Christ, it brings life to others. You know, as you take up this Lottie Moon offering and it goes, and, and I shared last Sunday evening, I'm very appreciative for the Lottie Moon offering. It, it helped pay for me when I served with the IMB. And, and it was such a, a blessing to me. But here's the reality. As every missionary who goes, who has said, I'm going to sacrifice my life. I'm going to leave my loved ones behind. I'm, I'm going to leave my friends behind. I'm going to leave the, the future that I've been planning and I've been building behind. And I'm going to go and serve. It brings life to others. When we die to ourselves, it brings life to others. Then he says that I, by, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I, I want to know this, that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This means to arrive at your destination. And I think about what does it mean to obtain the resurrection of the dead? Well, several things are going to happen when that day comes. One, there will be no more sin. We won't deal with sin anymore. That will be a wonderful, wonderful day. Amen? We still struggle. We still fall. We still fall short of God's glory. We still transgress the law. But one day that will be no more. And nothing will hinder our fellowship. With Christ. You know, the greatest thing about when Jesus returns is that we'll get to spend eternity with him. So Paul says, this is, this is what I'm shooting for. This is my goal. This is what I'm after. But how do we get there? Well, he gives us some instruction. Verse 12 says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. First of all, we see Paul's acknowledgement. He realizes he hasn't reached it yet. <clears throat> he hasn't arrived. He isn't fully mature. He isn't perfected yet and we must realize that as well we have not obtained the goal yet we do not have the intimate personal relationship with Jesus that we desire to have we have a relationship but we want to go deeper we want to know him more we want to experience the power of his resurrection in our life we want to fellowship with his sufferings we want to know him more but we haven't yet arrived we have to acknowledge that but then second we see his action he says he presses on. And this is what I want you to get. Paul was very intentional about his living. This word press on, this phrase here, is in the active voice and it's in the present tense, which that means continual action, means habitual action, means every day you wake up and you say, Lord Jesus, 
Help me to know you. Help me to live for you. Lord, give me a desire for your word. Give me a desire to know you more and more. And it's pressing on daily, day after day after day, continuously. As you walk through the day, you pray without ceasing because you're constantly saying, Lord, help me know you more. And you press on and you're intentional about it. And friends, I want to tell you, routine dominates us. We get up for work, we go to work, we come home, we do what we need to do with the kids or the grandkids, or we come to church and listen, routine can kill a church. You realize that? Routine can kill a church that you have a purpose and that purpose is to reach a lost city. That's why God has you here, to reach a lost city and we can get where we've got our routine at church And it may not be reaching people, but we keep doing it because we're dominated by routine as opposed to living a purposeful and intentional life. He presses on, but one of the things he has to do, he forgets what lies behind. He forgets the past. He lets it go. I want to say there are two things he has to let go and two things that we have to let go. First of all, we have to let go of past failures. If there was anyone who had past failures in his life, it was the Apostle Paul. He was a murderer of Christians, a persecutor of the church. If there's anyone who could say, listen, you don't know my past. There's no way God could use me. It would have been Paul. Yet he had to let go of that. There may be some here this morning that there's something in your past where, where you had a, an epic failure and, and, and you say, there's no way the Lord can use me. Listen, we serve a God who forgives and a God who restores. I love the passage in 1 John where it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever maybe gone a couple days without a shower or maybe you've been out in the yard and one nice thing about Vegas we don't have the humidity like we do back in Mississippi where I'm from you know Mississippi you just you're dripping I mean you're dripping where I lived in the Middle East it would get to 120 125 with 90 percent humidity I mean I would come back from teaching English and and it looked like I'd gone wading in my trousers because they you know I was just sweating and and There have been times where I've been camping or maybe I've been in a remote area and I just couldn't get a proper bath and you feel gritty and dirty and and you get in that shower and you take that hot shower and and when you step out of it in a cool breeze and you feel clean, isn't that a wonderful feeling? You see, that's what Jesus does in our lives. He could have said, fine, I'll forgive you, but I'll leave you defiled. I'll leave you nasty. I'll leave you dirty, but he doesn't. He says, I'll forgive you, and I'll clean you. Let go of past failures so that you may press on. But the second thing you've got to let go of are past victories. Again, Paul, he he could have said, you don't know my past. I, I failed miserably, but he had let go of that. But Paul also could say, well, you don't know my victories. It's time for me to take a break. It's time for someone else to step up. It's time for someone else to serve. But Paul didn't say that. Have you ever had someone say in church, and maybe you said this. If so, we'll have a time called the invitation where you can come and pray. It's not really an altar. It's padded steps, but that'll work. Well, actually, y'all do have a prayer bench. I love that. I saw that last week. Maybe you're guilty of saying this or you've heard it said, well, I've served for years. It's time for someone else to step up and serve. Or it's time for one of those younger people to start serving. Well, you're partially right. It's time for them to serve. Amen? But as long as we're drawing breath, it's not time for us to step aside. Listen, when Jesus returns, I want him to find me faithful. Amen? And it's so easy to to look and say, gosh, I did this and I did that for the Lord and I've served and now it's my time to just relax. Listen, retirement is not a biblical principle. Now, there may be a time where you stop what you're doing in secular work and you transition, but this idea, well, I served and now I'm going to spend the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years of my life, 
not serving the Lord because I'm in retirement, that's, that's a load of rubbish. It's not biblical. Listen, this isn't our home. There's a time to stop, transition, retread, but you keep serving until you are home. Churches, I, I've, I've preached in a lot of churches. And in some churches you realize, gosh, this church is dying and they don't even know it. You know one of the greatest ways you can tell if a church is dying? If they spend a lot of time talking about their glory days. Oh, we used to have these programs and we used to have this and we used to be full. And they live in their glory days. They live in their past victories. Friends, you've got to forget them. And you've got to look to the future. He says he reaches for it. He stretches. He stretches. Friend, if you're going to impact the world for the gospel, God's going to have to stretch you out of your comfort zone. That's just reality. We see that throughout the Bible. We see it throughout the New Testament that God had to stretch those who served Him in order for them to be effective. And you know, it's so easy for us at church to get comfortable. I like the way we do the music. I like the order of service. Listen, I can't tell you how many church fights I've known of because they changed the offering from the middle of the service to the end of the service. I'm serious. I mean, pastors getting horrible comments and emails and letters saying, everybody knows that people who love Jesus take the offering up in the middle of the service, not at the end. I mean, why, why is it? Because we're comfortable. I like to know when to stand up and when to sit down, and I want to make sure I know all the verses to the songs, and, and it's to the style of my choosing. I like to be around people that I know, and so when a lot of new people come, it can get uncomfortable. Friends, if we're going to accomplish the mission God has for us, we're going to have to stretch. Paul reached out. And then finally... He remained focused on the goal and the prize. What is the goal? You know, when I think about heaven, I, I think about the fact that it describes it like streets of gold and like a crystal sea and, and, and just no more weeping and no more death. And, and that's a wonderful thing. But is the place of heaven the goal that Paul wrote about? The answer is no. You know what the goal is? Jesus himself. You see, friends, a great mystery, a God who does not need us, a God who is fully self-sufficient in his own person, desires to have a relationship with us. And though he could give us all the world, he gave us something better, himself. You know, there's a movie coming out in a few weeks or months. Uh, I've seen previews for it. It's called Heaven is Real. Have you seen the previews for it? It's based off a book. This little boy had a near-death experience and survived and, and then all of a sudden started telling his family things that he saw in heaven. said he went to heaven and, and according to the book and the movie that he was able to give information that there's no way a boy his age could have known. And his is not the first story. There are others and other books that have been written about people who have gone to heaven, what they've seen, they describe it. And, and oftentimes uh, people say, Pastor, uh, is that real? Did, did it happen? And I say, well, I don't know. Could God allow someone to visit heaven and then send them back? Well, I, yeah, I think there's biblical precedence for it. You've got Isaiah. He looked and he was in the throne room of God. You've got the Apostle Paul. He shared a testimony that he died and went to heaven and then came back and says, I went to the third heaven, which that means the place where God resides. You have John in the book of Revelation that he was taken into heaven. So could it happen? Well, it's happened in the Bible. And they'll say, so, so should we believe what they say? Well, it's not the word of God. So it's interesting, but I wouldn't base my life on it. But here's the thing that concerns me about any conversation like that and concerns me about the movie. 
The thing is, as this little boy shares, everybody wants to know about their loved one who passed away or, or is there going to be pain and, and they want to know the details of what is heaven like. But friends, I want to tell you, though it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that those of us who are family members who knew the Lord, who died before we did, that we're going to be reunited with them. Though that's a beautiful thing, though heaven is amazing and, and it's glory and it's stupendous, and, and you think about the fact that God created this heavens and earth in six days, and yet He's been spending over 2,000 years preparing heaven for us, amazing things will be, be held there. But friends, I want to tell you, though I look forward to seeing some of my loved ones, though I look forward to seeing the amazing creation of God, the greatest thing about heaven is Jesus. You see, the Muslim heaven is, is one that says you get to do all sorts of things that gratify the flesh, but you don't get to be with God. The Hindu and the, the, the Buddhist heaven says, well, you cease to exist as an individual. So there's no enjoyment. You're just off the wheel of reincarnation. But God has said in His Word that He has given us Himself and will spend forever with Jesus. As we begin the new year, let me ask you this. Do you know Christ? Has there ever been a time where you've received Him as your personal Lord and Savior? Maybe today your response is like Paul, where he had been trusting in religion, he'd been trusting in being a good person, he'd been trusting in his family, and he realized he had to put his trust in Jesus alone. But maybe you're hearing you say, Pastor Neil, I've I've known Jesus for years. Well, let me ask you, as we begin this year, do you know him more today than you did last year? And when I say know him, do you have that intimate, personal relationship with him? Do you know his voice when he speaks? Do you want to know Him fully, that, that you know Him and the power of His resurrection? Do you know the fellowship of His suffering? Or have you put a line saying, Lord, I'll know you this far and no further? As we close this service, I'm going to invite you that if you need to know Jesus, in a minute we're going to have an invitation, I'll invite you to come and Pastor Johnny will be here and you can grab him by the hand and say, I need to know Jesus. I need to begin that relationship with Jesus. But maybe you're here today and you haven't been pursuing Christ. Maybe you're in a routine that includes coming to church on a regular basis, but you haven't been pursuing Christ passionately. That is the greatest goal you can have for the new year, to know Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that though you could have given us anything, Lord, you've given us the best. You've given us yourself. Lord, I pray that as we look to this new year, Father, that we would live a life of intentionality. Lord, that we would passionately pursue Jesus. Lord, there may be some here this morning who need to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and know what it means to be saved. Lord, I pray that they would come during this invitation. Lord, there are those of us who have already done that, but Lord, maybe we're holding on to things in our past, past failures or past victories, or Lord, maybe we've just been dominated by routine and we're not pressing on on a daily basis. But Lord, maybe the knowledge we have of you is more like what we know of Abraham Lincoln than the type of knowledge we have those who are closest to Father, there are some who are here today who need personal revival. Lord, today would they surrender. Lord, today would they repent of allowing routine to dominate as opposed to living intentionally. And Father, today would they begin to live in victory 
pursuing that prize, which is you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.